according to the Bible. Biblical means according to the Bible or pertaining to the Bible. Apologetics is from the Greek word apologia. That's a Greek pronunciation, apologia, which means answer or defense. This is the Greek word used in Acts chapter 22, verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. It is also the Greek word used in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Therefore, biblical apologetics is a defense of all that the Bible teaches. Biblical apologetics is a defense of all that the Bible teaches. Here we have a picture of Paul on the staircase being guarded by centurions and also by the chief captain who was the captain of 1,000 soldiers and 10 centurions. And he is allowed to defend himself before the Jewish mob that wanted to kill him because they had heard a rumor that he had brought some Greeks into the temple of God in Jerusalem and had defiled the holy place. And so in Acts chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. He was engaging in apologetics. He was defending why he was now a Christian. He was trying to explain and convince his hearers that they should also become Christians like he did and not be unbelievers and reject Jesus as their savior. Hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. Now, here are some actions that are involved in biblical apologetics. If I'm going to engage in biblical apologetics, what is it that I should do? Well, number one, I should defend what the Bible teaches. That is, be able to prove that what the Bible teaches is true, as I've already read from 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 15, the second action is contend earnestly for the faith. That's based on Jude verses three and four. Contend earnestly is made up of two Greek words that are joined to form one word. Number one, epi, a preposition, strengthens the action of the verb. And two, agonizomai, a verb that means to fight, struggle, strive, and strain every nerve. Therefore, contend earnestly means that we should do our best to prove that any teaching which is different from what God has revealed in the Bible is not true. The third action is described as pull down or cast down every reasoning that rises up in opposition to the Bible, just as a walled city in ancient times needed to have its wall or gates pulled down or cast down in order to capture the people in the city. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses four and five speaks about casting down or pulling down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Number four, capturing every thought with the truth of the Bible, just as people in a city whose wall has been pulled down are captured. And so Paul continues in the same scripture. And 
making every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we remove every objection that people raise against accepting God's teachings in the Bible. And we capture people's minds that they will accept Jesus as their savior and be obedient to his teachings. Number five, making every thought obey Jesus Christ, just as the people in a city which are captured come under a new and different ruler from that same scripture. Now here are some weapons that soldiers in ancient times used. What we have here in the picture are soldiers carrying a battering ram. We read about these in Old Testament warfare. It was made out of wood and at the very top you had a bronze head made to resemble a ram. And they would take these long poles of wood and they would hit it hard against the, the stone walls that surrounded the city and eventually bore a hole in the wall or eventually cause the wall to crumble and to fall down so that they would be able to enter in and capture these people and take them as prisoners and make them obey a new government that they would install in that city. Well, the walls that we see here in the picture or in the drawing are the objections that people make against believing what the Bible teaches. The battering rams are the, 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 the words from the Bible that we use to break down and to remove the arguments that are made, to show them that the arguments are not valid and that they can trust what the Bible teaches as being true. And once you break down these arguments so that they're no longer able to stand, then you are able to capture these thoughts represented by the people in the drawing to capture the thoughts of the person's mind and to convince them to submit or surrender to their savior and to their new king, Jesus Christ. Battering rams were used to pull down walls and gates of ancient cities. And that is the comparison Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Now let us look at examples of three persons that used apologetics, Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter, and the Apostle Paul. First of all, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John chapter 5, we read about Jesus healing a crippled man who was not able to walk for 38 years. And Jesus told him, to rise up and walk. It was the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees believed that Jesus was telling the man to do something wrong. That the man should not walk and take his mat and go home on the Sabbath. And so they came to Jesus to argue with Jesus about why he was breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus used five proofs to show that he had the authority from God to heal this man, even though it was on the Sabbath, and to tell this man to take up his mat and to go home. And the first proof is that John the Baptist had given his testimony about him, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that after him, is coming a man who is mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to untie the shoelace of his shoes. 
and that I can only baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I am not the Christ, but I was sent to prepare you for the Christ. They already had this testimony, and that is the first proof that Jesus has the authority to do what he did. The second proof are his miraculous works. The work of healing this lame man who had been crippled, unable to walk for 38 years, and was now able to walk because Jesus gave him the strength to walk, was proof that God sent him and that he had the authority to do what he did. The third proof is the father himself. The father himself had borne witness to Jesus when he was baptized, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The scriptures also bore witness to Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life. And these scriptures bear witness of me. Yet you will not come to me that you might have life. So Jesus said, the very scriptures you are studying bear witness to me. They prophesied about my coming. And the fifth proof that Jesus had the authority to heal this man on the Sabbath and to tell him to walk and to carry his mat on the Sabbath is Moses. Moses was the most respected biblical figure, humanly speaking, in the Bible, um, as far as the Pharisees were concerned. He was given the law from God and Mount Sinai, and he wrote the first five books that make up the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, most of which contain the laws that God gave to his people. Yet Jesus said in closing that Moses wrote about him. And if they don't believe what Moses wrote about him, how will they believe what he, Jesus, is saying about himself? And that Jesus said he will not accuse them on the day of judgment, that Moses himself will stand up and accuse them because they did not accept the person whom he wrote about. So what Jesus was doing was apologetics. He was giving proofs or evidence why they should accept him as having the authority to do what he did on the Sabbath day. Another example of someone doing apologetics is the Apostle Peter. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the disciples began to speak in different languages and a crowd came together, Peter stood up with the 11 other disciples and told the crowd that God had given witness to Jesus by working miracles through him that they themselves knew about that Jesus had fulfilled the prophecies that the Messiah was going to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that he would bring salvation to Israel and to the Gentiles, and that he would do this by suffering and dying on the cross, and that on the third day, God would raise him from the dead. So Peter gave Jesus rising from the dead as fulfillment of these prophecies. And then Peter, number three, gave his own testimony and the testimony of the other apostles that we are witnesses of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And so in these ways, he proved that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ, God's chosen king, and savior of Israel and of the world. Number three, the apostle Paul practiced apologetics. In Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31, he gave uh, an explanation as to who the true God is. And he did so in four ways. Number one, 
he used what they believed to introduce the God whom they did not know. He started with a writing he found on an altar in Athens that says to an unknown God. And then he says, I will tell you about the God whom you do not know. Then number two, he used what the scripture said about God, but he did not quote from it directly since the people of Athens were not familiar with the scriptures as the Jewish people were in Jerusalem. And so he did not use the scriptures directly, but he used what the scriptures said about God. And what did the scripture say about God? The scriptures said that God created the world and everything in it, that he does not need anyone to give him life or to feed him, that he himself gives life to everyone. Also, he showed that God is in charge of all nations, that God is the one who put nations where they are in the world. He is the one also who is in charge of history. He planned what would happen before time. And therefore, he is in charge of all that goes on. He also shows that every nation on earth came from one ancestor, that God created from one blood, from one ancestor, that is Adam, all the different nations of the world. So all nations are obligated to listen to their creator. Number three, he used logic or reason based on what they already believed about their relationship with God. They believed that they were children of God. And so he says children resembled their father. They resemble their mother. They resemble their, patient, their, their, their parents. Now, if you are children of God, then you must resemble God and God must be like you also. But look at these images of false gods and goddesses you have made. They don't have a brain like you have. They can't think. They cannot breathe. They cannot walk. They cannot talk. God can do all of these things because you and he are alike. You are his children. But if you are really his children, how could these idols that you have made be real gods? They're not real. So he used logic based on what they already believed about their relationship with God. And he used history to show that God is in charge of everything. And the purpose of people being around, the purpose of God creating human beings in the first place, is that they would search for him and find him, even though he's not far from each one of us. And then he ended his lesson by letting them know that God is commanding all of them to give up their worship of these false gods and to believe in Jesus. Because when Jesus comes again, he will judge people from all nations. And if they don't believe in the true God and follow Jesus, um, they're going to be punished on the judgment day. And that was um, enough to persuade a few persons to become followers of Jesus. So these persons, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, are examples that I've taken from the Bible to show how um, they did their work of apologetics, that is defending their faith in God, their faith in the Bible, and encouraging people to do what God wanted them to do from the Bible. Now, finally, what is the goal of biblical apologetics? What is it that I am supposed to lead a person to? Well, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, the goal is to take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. That means 
convince people completely so that they believe with all of their heart that there is a God, that he sent Jesus Christ to save us from sin through his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection from the dead, and that they should live a new life of obedience to God because Jesus is coming again to judge the world and to take into the kingdom of God those that have been faithful to him, but to punish those who were um, disobedient and refused to accept him as their savior and Lord. So the goal is to take every thought captive and to make it obey Christ, to lead people to believe in Jesus as their Lord and savior, to turn from their wicked ways and to do what God has commanded, to confess Jesus as their Lord or as the risen Christ, the son of God, and to baptize them in water by bearing them in water in the likeness of Christ's death and burial and raising them up out of the water in the likeness of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. That is the goal of biblical apologetics. And then to teach them to do everything Christ has commanded so that they may be faithful disciples of Jesus serving him every day until the day of their departure from this life to be with Christ, which is far better. So the goal is to take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. The goal is not so much to win a debate. It is important to win debates, but that is not our only, and that is not our greatest goal. Our greatest goal is to convert people so that they give up their unbelief and they believe in God, they believe in his son, and they follow Jesus as their Lord and savior. That is the goal. If we win a debate, that is good. But if we, in the process of winning the debate, turn off people, from wanting to listen to our teachings, then we will not have accomplished the ultimate goal of apologetics, which is to take every thought captive and to make it obey Christ. All right. Now I have just completed um, lesson number one. Let me just briefly recap it, and then I will show you what you need to prepare for for next week. First of all, I looked at why it is important to study biblical apologetics, not only Christian leaders, but every member of the church. I have shown that atheism is on the rise. Laws are being made, made by governments that are against the, the laws of God. The Bible is not being respected by governments and by many nations as the standard to decide what is right and wrong. And so there is a need for people in the church, not only the leaders, whether they be evangelists, whether they be elders or deacons, whether they be teachers, every member of the church should understand the Bible well enough to be able to defend what it teaches. Then we looked at the definition of biblical apologetics. Biblical means according to the Bible or pertaining to the Bible. Apologetics means answer or defense. So biblical apologetics is a defense of all that the Bible teaches. We looked at actions that are involved in biblical apologetics, such as defending what the Bible teaches, contending or fighting earnestly for the faith, not physically fighting people, but using biblical arguments to convince people that what they are saying is wrong and what you are saying from God's word is right. Number three, pulling down every reasoning 
that opposes what the Bible teaches. That will require some knowledge of what these people believe. If you don't know what they believe, then you, you will be at a disadvantage. It is better to become acquainted with at least some of what they believe that is in opposition to what the Bible teaches. And you will be better able to specifically point out the differences between what they believe and what the Bible teaches and why they should accept what the Bible teaches and reject what they have previously believed. Number four, capturing people's thinking. Number five, making them obey Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And these are, this is a drawing of old time methods of destroying city walls and capturing people. The use of long poles of wood with bronze metal at the end shaped like a ram's head and or uh, another instrument that looks like a big sword, it's pointed and you're battering the wall and boring holes in the wall to weaken it. We are to use our biblical um, teachings to destroy and to remove arguments that people have which block them from accepting um, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We looked at examples of people who used apologetics, Jesus, the, the Apostle Peter, and the Apostle Paul. And then we looked at the goal of apologetics, which is to convert people, not so much to win arguments, but to convert people so that they become disciples or followers of Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to do in preparation for next week's class, Friday, January 28, is to, well, let me move on, is to prepare for test number one by studying this lesson. Why should every Christian study biblical apologetics? There are three ways you may prepare for it. Number one is to look at the PowerPoint presentation that I will send to you later on today. Number two um, is, is to um, look at the recording of this. It is being recorded at this time. Look on the JSP YouTube channel and you can have a replay of the video. And what will guide you from week to week to know where I am in the course and what I will be teaching is the course outline that I will be sending to you as well. Okay, so prepare for test number one. Why should every Christian study biblical apologetics? Okay, um, is there any question that anyone has? Uh, no, sir. No question. That is no. All right. Okay. At this time, we're going to be going to God in prayer. And uh, Lord willing, I will see you next week as we resume our classes on Thursdays and Fridays in my courses. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you may help us to learn very well how to defend our faith in your existence and in your authority to decide for everyone everywhere what is right and wrong. Help us to understand how to defend the Bible as the word of God. Help us to know how to defend Jesus as your son and the only one whom you have sent to save us from sin and to give us forgiveness and eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. We pray, dear Lord, that you will help us to study these lessons and to know them well, not only for test purposes, but to be able to convince a friend, to convince someone in the community who is not a Christian why they should believe 
and follow you and Jesus Christ, your son. We pray a blessing upon the food you have provided. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, God bless you all and take care. Thank you.